strength and honor. Strength and honor. Theodore Roosevelt once said, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Seize the day. Whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. Who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. And I'm gonna stay right here and fight for this lost cause. You've got to get mad. I mean plum mad dog mean. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Who at best, if he wins, knows the thrills of high achievement. And if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. I'm going to show you how great I am. He's someone who can handle that kind of pressure. You're creating a document that will be judged against all the great tenors who've recorded these arias. He's an extremely talented artist. He will be recording for six days with a 76-piece orchestra, a 45-person chorus. It's probably one of the biggest events of his life. Sounds like a lot of pressure. No. I accept the terms and conditions of my job. I wanted to craft a great music album, and I hope I do good justice to it. Hi once again, everybody. I'm Ed Berliner. Welcome to Studio A, and this is another edition of The Man in the Arena. The gentleman that you just met does indeed craft some of the greatest music around the world, and he is known for it around the world as well. He has performed at the Met, at the San Francisco Opera, at the Paris Opera, and many, many more. He is the first singer to win the Beverly Sills Artist Award and the Richard Tucker Award in the same year of 2014. And here's the great part of the story. He is also likely the only tenor in world history to basically get started or to at least know what it's like to be chased by an angry, an angry parent. Think about that for a moment. <laughs> That'll tell you a little bit about how he began his life as much more than just a tenor. There's a lot to this story as well. It is a pleasure to welcome into the man in the arena from Berlin, Germany, one of the finest at his craft, Michael Fabiano joins us. Michael, thank you so much for being here. Great to be with you today. This is the, the great thing about interviews and what I do for a living. Because as I go looking for really interesting people and go looking for great stories, I started this search out because I'm a baseball fan. I've done sports for many years of my career. And here in the man in the arena, I haven't yet talked baseball in the 2019 season. I said, okay, <laughs> let me find a former umpire because there's so many changes going on in umpiring now in Major League Baseball. Let me, let me see what a former umpire thinks about it. Flip, flip, flip. Thank God for Google. Wait a minute. A tenor, a world-class tenor happens to be <laughs> happens to be a former umpire. So now, you get to tell us this story because that's how we got together. That's how we got started. I want to let you dig a little deeper into that story, please. You know, it's funny. I I I have a <clears throat> a rostrum of parent stories and there's there are there's probably 3 or 4 that I've told. Uh, I'm not sure which one you're referencing, so I'm going to take a stab and, and go for it. Every when angry I, parent I, seems to be the same after a while, right? <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's a lot of angry parents when something doesn't go their way. I'll just say that. But when I was uh, I was umpiring Babe Ruth ball, I don't know, ten years ago. I stopped umpiring baseball when I was 24. So I'm, you know, it it just it came too much into conflict with my career. But the angry parent story is this: I was. I was the plate umpire of a Babe Ruth uh, game in, oh my God, it's nine years or 10 years or 11 years ago. I'm not exactly sure now. And I made a call that was, uh, I would say it was, it, was a, it was a tag out at third base and I had to run up the line and make it because there were two, there were two officials on the field. It was just me at the plate and someone in the field and I had to make the third base call. Called a, called a, a runner out. It was close. I don't know. I'm, 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 it could have been. It could have gone the other way. Punched him out. That was it. The coach was visibly drunk. 
<laughs> which I didn't see until <laughs> until that moment when I got close, pushed me. I asked him to step back. He didn't step back. I said that he was, you know, I heard, I smelled that he was drunk. I saw that he was drunk. I threw him out of the game. He was gone. The crazier part of the story, though, was his wife was standing on the other side of the fence with a child in a carriage, and she jumped over the fence and started screaming at me, also drunk. So this was this was a really fun, fun story. That's that's one of them I tell. Did you so. kind of get a feeling at that point that <laughs> this is not for me? I, I, I really think this is fun doing the umpiring, but gee, I've got this wonderful career in singing. I, I think I'm going to spend a little more time doing this than no, having to worry I, about I, drunken I, guys on no, the field. No, 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 <laughs> really? no, no. I love that. I love that challenge. I mean, I deal with drunk people in my business too. I mean, I do deal with crazy people all, really? in every industry that I was sure. Come on, there's there's crazies everywhere you go, and that's that's par for the course in the world. That the key is how well can you be diplomatic with with uh, people that are difficult to deal with. And I'm going to just say that being an umpire has taught me uh, a, a large art of diplomacy and effective leadership in all the other things that I do now. And sure, I don't umpire anymore because I just don't have the time, of course. Um, but ha were I to start it up again, I would be, it'd be a joy. I miss it, I have to say. Would you go, wait a minute now, would you go back if you had the opportunity? Because look, you're so busy, you've got your first album coming out on May 17th, 2019, right. which we'll talk about momentarily. You travel the world, you are world-renowned for what you do, you now have your pilot's license, you, you right. are constantly on the go. Are you telling me you'd actually go back to umpiring every now and then if you had the chance? Uh, I don't. I mean, if if I didn't have the career that I had right now, I think about it. Just it's a, it's it, it 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 turned from being a job that paid bills for me to get to get me the ability to travel around the world and do auditions for my career. You know, I was making you know umpires at a lower level. They know they make seventy five bucks a game, fifty bucks a game, a hundred dollars a game in many cases, something like that. That's what I was doing. And it, it helped that kind of cash when I was 20, 19, 18, 21, that helped, 22. But no, I don't, I don't see myself doing it professionally. It just would be a hobby. When you just mentioned the word challenging, as I did my research on you, I heard that word, I read that word a lot in what you talked about, in that what you do is challenging. Now, I've, I've talked to many, many fine and, and many outstanding performers in my life. Um, comics, singers, actors. What is it about opera that is so challenging? Is it that individual nuance of just you being the focus of so much with such a large crowd and having to hit every single note every single time? What is that? First of all, I'll, I'll answer just the last bit of your question first, having to hit every single note right every single time. I actually reject that notion entirely. Okay. I don't think... I don't think it's it's just it's it's something that I ha had to change my mentality about as a performer. Psychology 101. If I seek to only do everything perfectly, which means hit every note every single time, I would have a very great difficulty in ever having success in a career. And I make the equation or the equivalency this way. A great baseball game for a great batter is a single, a walk, maybe a strikeout and a double. Not four home runs, not four grand slams. Four grand slams are hitting every single high note perfectly in the course of the night. It's the equivalent. So my burden is to communicate great music, show the public the arc of the entire performance as well as I can, knowing full well that I am not perfect and that certain notes are not going to be perfect, which is completely acceptable. Always was acceptable in the past, too. If I get close... If I come close or have a near perfect night, you know, great. I love it. But that's not my burden. So the, the, you asked about the challenge, which is a better question, even, even than the more specific question at the end. The greatest challenge of opera singing is that we are unamplified, right? Opera singers do not have any sense of uh, any uh, amplification when they're on a stage. So we have the burden of singing over an orchestra of 70, 80, 90, 100 instruments, not a couple of. Uh, synthesizers and a band, but a large orchestra with a huge brass section, percussion that could all be as, as, as large as 12 or 14 instruments, 
strings that could be as big as 60 instruments at different times. So we have to train intuitively to be able to take two little pieces of flesh inside of here, make them adduct perfectly so that over three and a half hours of singing, I don't fatigue. And I can carry my voice over that pit and into the theater and everybody can hear me perfectly. And so the challenge in doing that is living a really cloistered, tight, tighter life, I have to say, meaning I don't drink, I don't go out, I don't go to loud places. I, I keep I keep very good care of my instrument. And if I don't, I don't sing well. And that's just a reality. And there's the word. And as I've heard from great singers over the years, they use that word instrument. Right. Where was it in your in your growth as an artist, did you realize at, at the age? I mean, there's a, it's almost a two-part question here. When did you realize that that was your instrument and that you had to take such delicate care of it? And when was it that you realized on the stage, whatever it was, whenever it was, that this is it? This is me. This is Michael for the rest of my life. It's a great question. It's, it's a two-part two answer. First of all, I had the joy of studying with a man named George Shirley when I was at the University of Michigan. George was the first African-American to sing at the Metropolitan Opera, an African-American tenor. And I was taking voice lessons at the University of Michigan, though I had the intention of studying business when I was there. George said to me, Michael, do you realize the talent that you have? And I didn't really know that I had a great talent. I just thought I had a functional, good instrument. I had a loud voice. It came a lot. I have to say some of it came from learning how to make calls an ump as a baseball umpire. Um, and he said, you, you don't understand the quality of talent you have. There has not been a singer before you and likely won't be one after you that will have the quality of instrument that you have. Wait, st stop right. right there for one second in, 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 the, in the answer. That moment when you have somebody say something like that to you, because there are greats who say, you have the best basketball shot I've ever seen. You have the best swing I've ever seen. Right. You, have, you have the greatest mind I've ever seen. When somebody says that to you who you mm -hmm. respect, does that send a chill up, up your spine? Just go... Wow, what I just got told, that has to be difficult even to accept in many ways. I think we, we as individuals, as citizens, always have to be critical thinkers about everything that we do. And I always think critically when people uh, give me excess praise. And so initially, I heard it as excess praise. And so I kind of wiped it away for a few weeks, didn't think so. Until George said weeks later, he said that it really wasn't in his interest to teach me further if I didn't pursue singing as a real uh, metier, as a real way of life. Mm. And it was in those kind of moments that I, I realized that there was something special there and I needed to pursue it with vigor. And so I did. And I, he made a comment that has stuck with me and now I try to pass it to other people, which is extremely important he said when one has an incredible talent the talent is not for themselves it's for everybody else to enjoy and so my burden my moral imperative is to share my instrument with as many people in the world as i can because it's those people that need the catharsis of music the enjoyment of music the people that pay for it that deserve the opportunity of experiencing my instrument so effectively, my instrument is not just my own, it's everybody's. Yes, it's mine, but I have the burden of protecting it and keeping it sanguine and clean and healthy. And you so just, that's, that's, you, that's you used a word there twice that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little bit surprised at. You talked about your burden. Yeah. And for those people who are watching this and those who are fans of opera and who we will make fans of opera in this as well with the marvelous that's, work that you do, okay. they're going to catch themselves a little and go, a burden with, with that kind of wonderful talent? How could that be something that you feel you carry as a weight? I don't think a burden means a weight. I actually reject the notion of that question. I'd say that 
a burden is akin to a, a responsibility. And as such, since I have a, a responsibility uh, to deliver great music, I just have to keep my instrument alive and healthy at all costs. A burden for me is, is, is an imperative destined either by God or by somebody or by a group of people or by society. And in this case, it's been, it was initially destined by one person and then it became uh, a large quadrant of people that really felt that it was my responsibility to share my voice. And I, the thing, the important thing about burdens is that the individual has to accept that the burden exists. Otherwise, they have to step out. And I do. I accept it. I accept that I have a talent. I, have an, I accept that I have to serve it. I accept that I have to serve people. And that's what I do. I did read that there are certain operas that you won't sing because they're not challenging to me or the environment's not challenging. Could you explain that? Sure. There's there. In opera, there are thousands of titles that have been written over the ages. There are about 100 titles from the years of 1770 through about today that have stood the test of time. And many of them come from literature that we know from compo uh, writers like Schiller or Goethe or Shakespeare. Even the operas are based off of those people. But sometimes there are works that come from literature, from history, that don't have any real weight. And so, yes, it's important to share the voice and, and enjoy singing. But if there's a story that is, is not compelling on an emotional level and doesn't connect to the psyche of an average person that watches opera, then I'm not actually using my talent to the best of my ability. I should be sharing my talent in vehicles and silos by which people can have the greatest connection at the end of the night. And that's through stories that relate to them, that relate to people. So when I sing La Boheme, for instance, which is the most performed opera in the United States in the last 10 years by far, it's a simple story about uh, an individual in, in, in life dying of a tragic disease and how people around that person handle death. The emotions that we all struggle with when death comes to our loved ones is superimposed into this work. And so I'm able to be a catalyst for, for people to help them have catharsis when I'm singing it. When I sing a title that doesn't really deal with direct emotions, I don't think I, ha I have the ability to have as much of an impact on people. You mentioned the word catalyst. Mm. And I speak to a lot of really wonderful artists, jazz musicians here in the United States, singers, people who always believe that they are the catalyst for giving back to a next generation. And you have started an organization called, you co-founded Art Smart. It provides free weekly voice lessons to high school kids who lack access to the arts. And you said, if we don't help children now, it's not going to be organic for them to be participants in a classical arts world in 10 or 15 years' time. I have heard almost the same words from so many artists who say, we must teach the kids now. Music's not yeah. being taught in schools anymore. Yeah. It's almost foreign to so many kids now, for whether it's cost factors or whether somebody believes the kids don't want it. And we, I swear to you, I still hear this from so many people who will go, why is music so important? I have to stop myself and I have to shut my mouth and shake my head when somebody says that right. because that is such a creative manner for children to get them uh, to to present themselves. So with Art Smart, what is it you're trying to do and how important is that to you? Okay. This is a it's a great question. I really uh, deeply appreciate it. First, I want to reference just to the state of the arts in the United States in, with specificity. In the last 15 years, we've seen an average decrease in arts-related uh, funding in public schools, public education uh, of 40%, a decrease in 40% in funding uh, per capita. That, that in itself just tells you a lot about where the arts are going in schools. That's tragic. It's a, it's a big number. It's not consistent. If you go to the state of Texas, for instance, uh, arts education is still highly important. And people say, why is it that a red state like Texas cares about choir? <laughs> Why do they have some of the most important 
choirs in high school around the world. Well, choir is part of a church tradition. And so parents and the state really care about making sure their kids know how to sing well, because in church, as it is, choir is very important to them. So it's not, it's not uniformly bad. There are states where it's still extremely important. Music is still a big deal. Um, and so it's, it's a decentralized problem to the state, not necessarily centralized. Concurrently, I, I work in school districts with ArtSmart, with, with my organization, where we're watching federal school districts like in San Francisco say that they're going to remove almost all arts programming on the basis that it's elite. Mm. Arts education, oh. just education, is that it's elite. It's not for kids, that they should be doing gym or they should be doing other things. And I just, I'm always reminded, first of all, of the, the quote that Winston Churchill, you know, said uh, during World War II, which is, what is, basically, what is there worth fighting for if we don't have culture? I'm not quoting him directly, but this is what he said. And he's right, because culture, music, dance, art, even creative writing, literature, it's all artistic. Without it, we don't have a vibrant society. There are, there are billions upon billions of dollars that support the infrastructure of the arts industry. And if, any, if our, any of our leaders ignore this, they're doing, a huge disservice to, they're doing a huge disservice to working Americans. So Art Smart was created largely because of what you said, the quote that I said. We know that if we don't teach kids music now in a fundamental way, that we're going to have a culture gap over the next several years, a, di a diminished impact of culture and society, which means a potential for an employment gap in other industries. There are so many studies that just suggest that without culture, it's likely that many other industries that support entertainment will disappear. So by creating programs that serve kids in the inner city, I, not even the inner city, in rural America too, wherever we are, where there is limited arts funding, we're ensuring that there'll be people around to care about the arts, or be artists themselves, or artisans, or people that participate in the arts, and keep that air, that that world afloat, so that not only does art and culture become stay impactful in our society, but all the industries that serve it also are fulfilled. And it's just hugely important to us. The last thing I'll say is Art Smart. What we do is we provide one-on-one -on -one music lessons every week to children, and in many cases. We have kids that don't even have parents. They live in foster homes. Kids get a one-on-one -on -one experience with a very special mentor, a big brother, a big sister, effectively, that they never have had for years, maybe have never had at all. Nós invocamos a sede e a chama que venha o teu reino. Nós nos rendemos e tudo entregamos para sempre. And because we're that organization that provides them this one-on-one -on -one opportunity of counsel, of mentoring, of, of education, of support, we're making sure that more kids are graduating with better grades and going to college beyond just studying music. And that's and, really what I hear. So many people talk about better grades, yeah. a better self-worth of themselves, absolutely, and, and gives them something that they can hold on to and they can call their own. Last thing I want to make sure that I get in here, and by the way, artsmart.org, we'll make sure that everybody sees it. We have been flashing it here on the video portion of the show during the interview, so we'll make okay. sure to send everybody there. However, I do want to point out that as we record this interview, we are before the release of your first solo album, which comes out on Pentatone on May 17th. What was it like recording the first solo and being the focal point right there? It's all your baby. Yeah, it's recording an album is is a tour de force because it requires more focus than even singing on stage. The reason why it requires focus is because unlike in on in a live performance where we don't really strive for a perfect perfect game, so, you know, so to say, we strive for just a, a beautiful show. 
in the recording studio, we aim to create moments of grandeur that are as close to the mark as perfect, because it's it's something that we want to be locked down in history for perpetuity. And so, when I sing an out, when I sing a, a piece, for instance, an aria from an opera, say by Rigoletto, okay, we'll take it once. We'll we'll play it. The orchestra will play it. We'll go into the studio and we'll listen and we'll say, okay, these are the, the 38 problems with this piece and notate them all and then go back and either start from the beginning and re-record it again and again or find spots that we need to clean up. And sometimes it's not with me. Sometimes it's the orchestra. Sometimes there's a dog barking in the street. Sometimes something is happening. Someone's cell phone goes off that ruin a perfectly great track. So we have to, we have to change certain little things. So at the end of the day, What's so tricky about an album is remaining in full vocal health for several days in a row, singing over an orchestra of immense power and and keeping that stamina intact. And I admit that by the end, I was worn out and emotionally and physically. And I, ha I have a lot of empathy now for my colleagues that have done great albums and how much work they had to put into them. <laughs> it always is. No, no matter who the performer is, they go, now that I've done it, now I know exactly what everybody's gone through. Now I understand it. I want to remind everybody that you can learn more about Michael's work at michaelfabianotenor.com. Also, the album is coming out. And again, as we record this, you may be watching it after the date. The album comes out on May 17th on Pentatone. And I can tell you that as the music guy, I am enthralled by listening to your work. It is absolutely soaring and brilliant, and I'm so glad that you're not doing umpiring anymore. Stick stick with what you <laughs> stick with what you got, brother. It's 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 outstanding. I really wish you a tremendous amount of luck. I hope we get to do this again, and I hope more people not only learn about opera but learn about ArtSmart at ArtSmart.org and learn more about your career. Michael, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank it you. has been a pleasure indeed. Don't forget, that website again for Michael is michaelfabianotenor.com. Learn more about his career as well. Also, if you want to find out more about us, don't forget our information, the email, arena at edberliner.com, our social media, at Berliner Speaks, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, our podcast platforms, iTunes, Google Play Music, TuneIn, Radio Public, Spreaker, Spotify, CastBox for Android. Don't forget on YouTube. We got it all covered, people. We got to get this all done here in 2019 and beyond. Go to welcometothearena.com. That's our YouTube page. And also you can access all the video and all the audio, just in case, at edberliner.com. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. This is the only place where you can find fascinating stories and interesting people. From Studio A, this has been The Man in the Arena. I'm Ed Berliner. Rock on, true believers. <laughs>